this study is just such a great example of why we really need to read critically the literature, especially when the headlines are so egregious or they, they seem to be saying something that's really important for policy. So the title of this article that we're reviewing today is called the Value of Nurse Practitioner Inpatient Hospital Staffing. And it was published in the journal Medical Care, and that was released in October of 2021. The objective was, the, the, the introduction said, we know that having more nurses and having RN staffing in hospitals is associated with better outcomes. Therefore, why wouldn't having more nurse practitioners also improve outcomes as well? So the objective read, to determine whether the presence of more nurse practitioners produces better patient outcomes net of RN staffing, so independent of registered nurse staffing. In the abstract, they said that having more nurse practitioners in an acute inpatient setting lowered mortality, lowered seven-day readmission rates, decreased average length of stay, lowered costs, that patients and nurses in these hospitals with more NPs reported better quality, better safety. The nurses themselves, the RNs, said that they had less burnout, that they had higher job satisfaction, greater intention of staying in the job, and in summary, quote, having more NPs in the hospital has favorable effects and it adds value to labor resources. So that's a pretty bold conclusion that basically saying that it just sold a wealth of improvements from having more nurse practitioners. So this study looked at data from one year between 2015 and 2016. They analyzed data from 579, what they called hospitals, but Dylan, these were actually acute care hospitals or facilities. Can you describe how that might be different from what we think of as a hospital? It looks like it was mostly kind of acute care surgical patients. They're typically not as medically complex if possible. If, if the surgery can be held off, it, it, it's held off typically if there's significant medical comorbidities. So it kind of looks like they were looking at it like surgeries that are just above outpatient surgeries. Like they, they required a night or two or something. But in that situation, you could argue that NPs may be helpful as, ex, as extenders, but I think it's very far from the idea of where their conclusion lands, which is NPs should be inpatient. Essentially, they're they're stretching that to say that they should essentially become hospitalists and replace hospitalists. Right. I mean, just the title of itself of this article is inpatient care. And they don't mention in the headline, the title, that this is specifically acute care post-surgical care. This is not something that can be extrapolated to all hospitals, even if the results are valid. And then they looked at four states, California, Florida, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. They randomly surveyed nurses and they got the nurses off of the state license lists. And they mentioned that, first of all, they didn't even know that these nurses even worked for the hospitals. They had to go back, I guess, and retroactively figure out. They asked the nurses if they worked for a particular hospital, and then they apparently went back and somehow manipulated the data because they said here, the response rate of hospital nurses is unknown because our sample frame included all RNs without information on whether or where they were employed. In their survey responses, however, nurses told us whether and where they were employed, and hospital nurses provided their employing hospital name, enabling us to link respondent to hospitals, yielding a comprehensive database. They, they don't say how many people answered the first survey, but they it obviously wasn't adequate because then they went back and then they intensively resurveyed. And what they did was they used, quote, extensive recontacts. So they really tried to track people down. They used monetary incentives and they even gave them a shorter version. So they ended up with a final response rate of 87%. But then they claimed that they weren't worried about all those efforts they made. They said that that was, quote, nearly unbiased because there was no differences in the in the answers compared to the initial people that weren't prompted. And then this second group, they literally had to pay nurses to to complete this study. And I think part of why they did that is because they wanted to reach that percentage that was high enough that they could cite that one source from like two decades ago that says this means that it represents the larger body better. I thought it was very interesting too, um, just that they had to try so hard to get the responses that they needed to make this study happen. You know, if, if there was no difference between 
the initial survey and the post survey, why did they even need to go further? Like if they had enough data to start with, they could have just ran the numbers there. The, the main way that they obtained their data, everything was based on one number, which was the ratio of nurse practitioners to hospital beds. And the way they obtained that was by asking these nurses who answered the survey to estimate the number of nurse practitioners working at their hospital. So I, I don't think they ever intended to actually get a better measure of how many MPs were in the hospital. I think the survey data of these RNs essentially guesstimating was all that they planned on doing. I mean, they at least admitted that it was kind of arbitrary and crude, but I think they 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 kind of breeze over that real quick in one sentence. Whereas, like at the core of this, this is this is nurses guessing how many NPs are in their hospital. Yeah, these are registered nurses that are just hospital employees. That's like if you said to me, "Hey, you're you're credentialed at your local hospital. How many doctors do you think work at that hospital?" And me being like, I, I don't know, maybe like a hundred, you know, and maybe there's 500, like, I'm just guessing I have no idea. And you're just going to take my guess and you're going to base a study around it. Am I crazy? Or is this just, how did this get published? That's really the problem. Like we almost could stop here and just say, look at that study design. Like this is, we know how bad people are at estimating, you know, big things like that. And I, I couldn't guess how many NPs per hundred beds there are in the hospital I work at. Well, the other thing they asked the nurses was were to self-report the outcomes, meaning they asked them things like, do you think your hospital is very good? Do you would you recommend your hospital to someone else? Um, how how do you feel the administration responds and how do you feel patients do? It was very, very subjective. You're going to RNs and you're saying, hey, number one, how many um, NPs do you think will work at your hospital? Number two, do you like your hospital? Do you think that it's good? Are you happy with it? Number three. And then, so again, this is all, these are perceptions that people have and there's really no facts to base these feelings on. They may be true, but they may be completely untrue. And we don't know, and we have nothing to compare this against. And then ultimately they claimed that the hospitals, the, the nurses that said that they had more nurse practitioners at their hospital rated that facility more highly. And then they went back and they, I guess, cross-matched the number, the facilities with more nurse practitioners, according to nurses estimates, as matching to having lower immortality, shorter average length of stay, lower costs. Let's go back to the lead author, which is who is Linda Aiken. She's a PhD with the Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Talk about some of the other background of the other authors on this study and where they got their funding. The funding for the study was provided by the National Institute of Nursing Research of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the National Council of the State Boards of Nursing. Right. I noticed that all of the authors on the study were PhDs. There was a DNP, which is a Doctor of Nurse Practice, a nurse practitioner doctorate degree, and that really that they all pretty much came from nursing schools and nursing institutions. So Dylan, did you feel that there was a sort of a vested interest in these results being what they were? So that's one of the things that I kind of highlighted. Everyone there is a PhD or NP and there's a DNP. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, all of the funding sources were from nursing colleges at, at universities or to the Robert Woods Foundation things like that, that have historically kind of pushed for more nursing practice rights and things like that. The conclusion of the study, taking it back to our journal club for our conclusion, which is having more NPs in hospitals has favorable effects on patients, staff nurse satisfaction, and efficiency. NPs add value to existing labor resources. Did this study show that? It, taking into account that we've talked about some questionable, me questionable methodology, it does appear to show that. And common sense would dictate that that's the case. If you have more NPs, you know, their conclusions say that NPs in advanced care roles and inpatients are a valuable adjunct to existing inpatient hospital physician and RN professional care. That makes sense, right? I mean, adding more NPs, more staff, to existing physician and RN professional care improves outcomes. 
that I can believe. Um, the, uh, the part that I have issue with is their discussion section and um, how they say that their findings are relevant to policy debates about NP scope of practice and um, unsupervised uh, nurse practitioner practice. That is, it, it's not necessarily the conclusion section, it was more the discussion section that I had issue with. Yeah, same here. It, you know, they made their conclusion that NPs have value, but, and then the discussion was essentially that there's these autonomous practice agreements, these collaborative agreements in states, and that we shouldn't have these essentially was the takeaway. And, um, and they, all four states that they did this in were in states that if you go to the AANP site, they don't consider it full practice authority for NPs. And so, you know, they, they, they sent this survey out to tens, you know, thousands of RNs across all sorts of states. And, and they could have easily done this in states where they actually have full autonomy if they wanted to actually test if they work in that setting, but they didn't. So what you're saying here is that, yes, the study shows that having NPs, and this is something we always say in PPP, NPs and PAs have value. They're important. They're important members of the healthcare team. And, but what the study does not say is that replacing physicians with acute care nurse practitioners in an inpatient setting is going to give patients those same outcomes or create all these benefits that they are kind of leading us to believe could happen based on this estimating study. If you'd like to learn more about this issue, we'd encourage you to get the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. It's available at Barnes & Noble and at Amazon. And if you're a doctor and you'd like to learn more about getting involved, we would love for you to join our group, Physicians for Patient Protection, our website, physiciansforpatientprotection.org. So we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks so much.